to express that this is not that complicated to understand, but I've distilled it down to some basic principles. And the first principle is that you have to eat a diet with a high micronutrient density. And that's really um, impacted a lot of people. Just that one basic principle. Eat a diet that has a high nutrient per calorie density. And what are those foods that are rich in nutrients we need to eat that have that protect us against cancer and heart disease? And I and enable people to identify green vegetables are the highest. And we could see that, that green vegetables, colorful vegetables, berries, onions, mushrooms, broccoli, carrots, beets, you know, all these things that have color are essential for our health. That's one thing. Right? The next thing is that we have to avoid foods that drive up cancer-causing hormones. And that predominantly is uh, um, a, a diets, and that predominantly is foods that are high in animal protein because animal protein is a, it promotes growth-promoting hormones being produced by the body. And the body produces extra growth hormone, an extra IGF-1, which is insulin-like growth factor one. It produces growth in the body. And when we're fully grown and we're not growing anymore, that excess, those extra growth-promoting hormones can promote cellular replication, cellular proliferation, and cancer. So we have to, and insulin is a growth-promoting hormone too. And we eat high glycemic carbohydrates and the combination of insulin going up from eating highly glycemic carbohydrates and IGF-1 going up from eating meatballs, let's say, and cheese, when we marry that together, ham and cheese, pizza, spaghetti and meatballs, we put together white flour with animal products together and we, and we raise insulin and IGF-1 simultaneously, now we have the witch's cauldron of cancer set into place because it's really raising both those hormones simultaneously that's most dangerous. So what I'm saying here is that this combination of eating a diet that's rich in nutrients, at the same time keeping processed foods and animal products to very low levels or out of your diet, is the secret that enables the body to function at a very high level of function. And we get our, we get our, can get our full exposure to all the nutrients the human body needs. We want to pay attention to getting the full exposure to that full variety of food being aware of there's, no, there's nothing missing in that human's need for excellent health. We don't want to be low in iodine or zinc or B12 or DHA. Or, so we want to make sure we have everything the human body needs. We want to make sure we don't have excess of stuff it doesn't need. Because excess of some of those things can be dangerous. And we want to make sure also that we're not exposed to carcinogens, toxin, toxins, infectious agents, you know, chemicals. We want to make sure we're eating a diet that's relatively clean. When we achieve those four basic premises, nutritional density, comprehensive adequacy of all nutrients being present without, without exceeding the need, right? Um, not getting too much hormones present and avoiding carcinogens or toxins. When we, when we try to look at all those different compartments of what makes an excellent diet, then we see the body is able to fix itself. We don't need remedies. We don't need drugs. We don't need magic pills and herbal potions and all kinds of, you know, different types of, we just, the body fixes itself automatically when the optimal environment for healing is established. I've written about eight books, I think, to date. Um, and there's some changes in my, in, since I started writing books in 1995, I think it was, some changes. Um, I think one change that we've recognized in the last five years is that I used to write and think that caloric restriction was a major, was the only um, scientifically proven way to extend lifespan of animals, including humans, by eating less food in an environment of nutritional adequacy. And now we know that that is not enough. That even if you eat less food, if you still eat too much animal protein, it drives up IGF-1. So I have to refine that and say that you have to, eating less will extend lifespan. But if we put people in the biosphere who ate less, if they were still eating 20 to 30% of calories from animal protein, which drive their IGF-1 too high, they weren't gonna see the benefits we see with animals that, eat, that we can restrict their calories on. And we don't have to be that, we want to not exceed our caloric need. But we don't have to be severely caloric restricted. We just have to not consume excess. We have to not consume excess calories, but we have to especially not consume excess protein because the excess protein can derail some of these lifespan benefits that are possible for humans. I don't have a specific amount of calories to recommend for people because obviously some people need very little calories and some people need much more based on their own metabolism or genetics or their activity level, right? So the point here is that 
instinctually, when you eat very healthfully, your body gives you the signals and tells you how much to eat. You don't feel like overeating anymore. You eat the right amount and you stop eating. And you wait till you get hungry again to eat because you enjoy food more when you're truly hungry. When you eat improperly, when you don't meet the body's nutri nut nutritional needs, then you develop perverted food cravings. You develop what I call toxic hunger. You're never satisfied. You always want to overeat. So I'm saying that, that the, the core, the basis, is to flood the body with the nutrients it needs, to eat healthfully. And then the amount of calories will naturally adjust themselves almost automatically because you won't, you'll lose your overwhelming drive to overeat that was causing people, that causes almost everybody to become overweight in this country. I've utilized fasting as a therapeutic modality for decades. But the problem is, is that most people can make complete recoveries without fasting. They, don't, they have to clean up their act. And if they don't frame the fast with excellent nutrition, they're not going to get any benefit out of it. So I, don't, I want to discourage people from thinking that fasting is the remedy they need to, you know, in, they need to adopt to get well. It's not. The dietary change is the remedy. In some cases, fasting can be used as a therapeutic tool to speed up the progress. Fasting can be used as a tool to get rid of their addictions and get them, their tastes reset to the right place. And fasting can take an asthmatic who can't breathe, who's taking in steroids or beta, or beta agonists causing to inflame the lung. Fasting can cool that down so we can get them off the medications and get them back on the right diet. And fasting can be utilized to get people who are food sensitive off that food sense stimulation from all the food and get them to their digestive tract to calm down so we can feed them right again without so much in, inherent um, excitation. So fasting can be utilized in some, um, in a way by a nutrition, by an expert here. But it's, but it's not, doesn't have to be, it's, it's, not, it's almost more rarely used today because these aggressive nutritional methods, which, can be, which now can be used to taste good, get such great results that we don't need to utilize fasting to get people to make complete recoveries.